welcome to the December 22nd, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the grand opportunity of looking together into this wonderful book, the Bible. And you know, in this program, we are ready to look at any part of the Bible, not that we know every answer, every thing about the Bible, but we... Uh, uh, through years and years of, of study have learned quite a bit about what the Bible is teaching and indeed God has opened uh, the spiritual eyes of many of us so that we are able to really uh, know a great deal about God's plans particularly for this day when we're just a couple of years away from the very end of the world itself wow what a big statement that is, just a couple of years away from the end of the world itself. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. Yes, hi. Yeah, go hi. ahead. Hi, Brother Camping. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know if, um, if in the timeline, with regards to the time, if... If the stopping of the sun during uh, the time of Joshua, if that was taken into the account uh, with the, the timeline of, of the end of the world? Well, no, because we, you know, that occurred, uh, well, let me see, it occurred, uh, uh, the fact is that God it, it, it tells us that the nation of Israel went out of Egypt the day after the uh, the um, institution of the of the um, of the the institution of the um, uh, of the Passover, uh, it was the fourteenth day of the first month of the of the biblical calendar, and then uh, the the long day of Joshua that occurred after they came into the land of Canaan some uh, months after uh, so it didn't impact at all the, the time from the, the, during the 40 years of the wilderness sojourn and the next time that we get to a specific time is talking about the dedication of the temple and tying that again to the biblical calendar so we just follow the language of the Bible uh, that's the only safe place that we can be and and how that impacted or whether it impacted I have no idea but uh, uh, it certainly did was a longer day for by several hours but uh, uh, I, uh, I don't think that it's anything that God expected us to take into account okay one more question uh, with regard to uh, Hezekiah when the Lord was going to take him uh, to be with him and then he prayed unto the Lord and the, the Lord uh, uh, turn back the was it the sundial I think or the shadow went back ten degrees would that take into account or uh, in other words would that factor in it anyway mean well, that it has I, to do I, with giving him time I, I don't know that's a very uh, very interesting uh, comment you make because it's even possible that God uh, uh, whatever whatever sh slight change or whatever change was made in the calendar because of Joshua's long day was set aside by the the uh, clock going back 10 degrees in the days of Hezekiah. So it, it became neutralized. That's very well possible. Mm, thank you very much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we, ver shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. How are you this evening, sir? Very well, thank you. I have two questions. First, in my daily life, I have struggles and trials and tribulations in my own personal life. How do I know where to go into the Bible to read for um, healing or guidance? Where do you go into the Bible to read for healing or guidance? Well, one of the, one of the best places to go is into the Psalms. The Psalms are wonderful. Now, some of the Psalms are dealing strictly with the Lord Jesus, and, uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are other Psalms that, 
uh, particularly when you get around Psalm 119, Psalm 103, in that area, uh, the Psalms can be very helpful. Now, when you talk about healing, we must remember that healing is the giving of life, because when we're when we're uh, uh, ill, we're dying. Our our life is ebbing away, and when we get healed, our life is uh, we get we get life. And Christ is the only giver of life. And so, whether we're saved or unsaved, whether we're elect or not, we can cry to Him for uh, for uh, help in. But we must never expect miraculous healing. Uh, that, uh, that is to expect God to bring some kind of, a, of information that is not in the Bible. And the, uh, but on the other hand, if we're, it's certainly the only place to really go as we take our medicine or, or get advice from our doctors or have an operation is we can plead with God, O oh Lord, in your mercy, could I have physical healing and wait upon him? Now, it doesn't mean he's going to give us physical healing because we finally want to always want his will to be done. And it may be his will that we're going to die of that illness or that operation that we just had. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Camping. Um, I got a question on uh, two two questions. Two questions. Uh, John fifteen, verse sixteen. John fifteen, verse sixteen. Let's take a look at that. John fifteen, verse sixteen. We read, uh, uh, "Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you." and ordain you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should rem remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of my Father, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, what is your question? Um, now, he's, he's talking to his disciples. He, he chose his disciples. Can you s still, like, refer that to how he chooses the, his, the ones he wants to save? Well, no, he is he is not only talking to his disciples, he's talking to every one of us. If we become a true believer, it's not that we chose him and that we chose Christ, but I have chosen you. And he he chose us from before the foundation of the world, at which time he also did all the work to save us. And But he chose us, look, that you should go and bring forth fruit. That is, you you are saved to serve, uh, to get the gospel out. Like we read in Corinthians, it says, Ye are my ambassadors, Christ, as it were, making his appeal through you. Or in First Peter, we read we uh, a beautiful statement that applies uh, to all uh, believers. He says in verse 5 of uh, First Peter chapter 2, he also, as lively stones or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That is a, a where we reign with Christ and we intercede on behalf of others as, uh, as our... Uh, that's why we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, that really should be translated, a purchased people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so uh, whatever our talent may be, it may be very minimal, or whatever our opportunity, it may be very minimal, but we want to make the most of what we can to uh, uh, of our time and our money to get the gospel out into the world. And particularly in this day, when we also have the the role that Jonah had in the, uh, when God was ready to destroy Nineveh, and with, with the role that Noah had when God was ready to destroy the world in Noah's day, we too have the task of warning the world 
that Judgment Day is almost here, and, and we can give you the details of it. I hand out a lot of the Does God Love You tracks for you. And um, I, I got a, real, a question that really has been, like, working on my mind a lot. When we get, get to heaven, will, will we be able to hold God's hand? Well, when we will we be able? <laughs> you, uh, we we don't know what's going to happen when we get to heaven. We know that at First John it says we will see him as he is, and and uh, we we will be like him. We know that, and uh, just how it's all going to be, it's all a divine mystery, uh, but it is super glorious, whatever it is. We are going to be reigning with Christ, and there's no marriage in heaven. We are the bride of Christ, and we are his sons, and uh, that is, we are in the most intimate relationship with him, But uh, and we know that it is super glorious, and we have to, and that's enough for any of us to be happy about. Yeah. Well, I hope I bump into you on the way up, and keep up the good work. Stop. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you. God bless you. May the Lord always keep you out of camping. I'm calling because I'd like to know, do you know Jesus Christ or not? Do I know Jesus Christ? Do you know, do you know if Jesus Christ or not? Do you know if he's Christ? Well, what is the Bible? The Bible is... The Word of God that is telling us all about the Lord Jesus. And if we've come to trust the Bible implicitly, knowing that it is the Word of God, we also will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We will, we will know Him as our Savior, as our Lord. Now, we can know, a, a lot of people say, well, I know Jesus Christ, I am a child of God, and they have no idea what it means to become saved. And if we're not a child of God, uh, because we have uh, have followed a do-it-yourself salvation program, we can learn a lot about Jesus through the Bible, but we don't really know him as our Savior. We think we do, but we don't. And, all, and you know, this is a phrase that a lot of churches and a lot of evangelists and Bible teachers use. Do you know Jesus Christ? As if... Uh, as if, uh, and yet they are teaching a do-it-yourself salvation program in which I have accepted him, I have come to believe in him, and therefore I know I know him, and in actuality they don't know him at all except what they read about in the Bible. Okay, one more thing. Um, you know about, um, what is Jacob's trouble? I'm sorry? Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. That's we read about that in Jeremiah or in Isaiah. I don't know someplace back there, and it has to do with the great tribulation. It is when we uh, work through those verses very carefully, if I recall correctly, uh, they have to do with the great tribulation. When, when uh, Jacob is a reference to all of the churches and congregations that. That uh, that uh, uh, and I I, I I believe I'm correct in that. But I, but uh, excuse me, uh, if you could tell me where that passage is, uh, I could answer more de de definitely. Uh, uh, I thought you know where it is, but thank you very much, Alex. Have a good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Camp. I just have a quick question. Uh, you said that you've. You don't listen to anyone except for what's in the Bible. That's all you go by. That's perfect. But if um, if um, May twenty first, twenty eleven comes and goes, and nothing happens, who would you, who would you blame then? Would you blame it on God, or would you blame it on the Bible? Because you no one else has you've listened to. So well, well now wait a minute. If we're going to trust the Bible, and the Bible tells us that May 21, 2011, is the date of the rapture, then that is it. That's what we don't, we don't even think about anything else. Because if we're saying, well, if it doesn't happen, what am I going to do? It means I don't trust the Bible. It means that I, I, I 
uh, I think maybe it's likely, it's possible, but maybe it isn't going to happen. I really don't hang my life on that. But the fact is, I hang my whole life on that. It's going to happen. It is what the Bible teaches. And uh, just like when uh, when um, Noah was told the exact date when the flood would waters were, that Christ would shut the door uh, uh, on uh, the 17th day of the second month of the calendar of that day, uh, he was he he believed that, and it did happen because it was the word of God. But there there are countless people today who are saying yes, it might happen. Yeah, it's possible. It's logical. It's it, well, they're going to be terribly disappointed because they're they have not really hung their life on the Bible. They aren't really trusting the Bible. Uh, the Bible is not their uh, uh, total authority, and I'm afraid that they're going to find themselves uh, entering into the day of judgment, that horrible day that begins the same day that God is catching up his true believers to be with him in heaven. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. The Bible uses a lot of different ways of describing the true believer. Can we compare a couple of verses? Uh, the first one is Proverbs 25, verse 2. Proverb, second, Proverbs 25, verse 2. Let's turn to that. There we read. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And the second one would be 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter, oops. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 12, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into, or the messengers desire to look into. Now, what is your question? Can the word angels there um, be uh, translated as a true believer? I, I believe that the word angel should have been it is the word messenger, that's a proper translation, just as the word angel is. But an, an, a messenger doesn't necessarily have to be a, 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 an angel. Every true believer is a messenger. And so in this context, this is what the true believers are looking into. They're searching the scriptures. But... We're only going to begin to get answers as God opens our eyes. And he had his timetable to do that. And so that for 1955 years, no matter how diligently or how faithfully or how uh, seriously uh, true believers search the scriptures, there was all kinds of information that God never did reveal to them. Okay. Uh, Can you also interpret... Hebrews 13, verse 2. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Hebrews 13, verse 2. There we read. Remember them... No, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained messengers unaware. So there again... The word angel is not a proper translation. It doesn't fit the passage. It doesn't fit the rest of the Bible. It is, uh, it is the fact that uh, to entertain strangers, if we analyze that, it's talking about 
uh, sharing the gospel with whoever, and uh, they're strangers to us, and yet, uh, and yet some of them may be already elected of God and, and already have uh, uh, been saved because they were, God did all the work of saving them before the foundation of the world, and yet they had not yet received their resurrected souls. So we were unaware uh, that, or maybe they did, but in any case, they were, uh, we, uh, we want to share the gospel with them. Okay, so it can be messengers or true believers? Messengers or those whom God plans to save. Or the elect. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please, welcome to Open Forum. Well, Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, I was wanting to know if Christ's incarnation was on the Day of Atonement, how come they didn't change the day to Christmas? After the Reformation, back to... Well, because the, the fact that Christ became a, ch uh, a child of God was not known until the last 20 years or so. Oh. So it was uh, it, all through the history of the church age. Uh, nobody had any real idea of when he was born, and December 25th was selected simply because... Well, it was a very good selection because it just a couple of days after the days are becoming longer again, the light is beginning to shine a little longer each 24 hours, just as today the light is a one minute longer today than it was yesterday. Oh, I see. Um, I was just on the Internet, and it was this site, Birthday of the Sun, and, and it was after a pagan, you know, and the Catholic Church had changed. Well, I, I don't know what the Catholic Church did, but at any rate, uh, this is uh, December 25th was as good a date as any and uh, better than some yeah. uh, to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ. But in actuality, in our day, because God has opened our eyes in a very precise way to the, uh, the working out of the timeline of history, we can be with relative uh, cer certainty that almost, almost complete certainty that he was born on October 2nd because that was the day of atonement and, and the, the evidence of the Bible at least brings us close to the first day of October and since God put a rule down that the ceremonial laws were shadows of things to come and the day of atonement was a ceremonial law and it was only a uh, one day off of October 1, it is very, very likely, very likely, although we can't say absolutely, but it was very likely he was born on October 2nd. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. And the number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camp, and I agree with you about the, the angel, the person who called up about the angel. I read, I think it's from Timothy, it says the elect angel. And the elect would only be those who are the children of God, the true children of God. Um, anyway, I have three statements here. I want to see if you agree with them. They're going around on the Internet about your teaching. And one of them says, Allah is the God of the Bible. Would you agree with that? What are the statements in there? That Allah is the God of the Bible? Yes, that's true. And uh, we don't see it in our King James Bible, and you don't see it either in the concordances like Strong's or Young's concordance but but if you look carefully at the at the Hebrew in the book of Daniel and in the book of Ezra in those two books uh, the word that is used for God is Allah as a matter of fact the letter the in in Genesis chapter 1 it says in the beginning God Elohim and Elohim could be pronounced Allah him. Uh, him makes it a plural word, 
uh, and uh, uh, so the word Allah is not at all strange to the Bible. Two more, okay. Those who do not know the date, May 21st, 2011, will be in hell forever. Well, those who don't know of the date, this is what our business is as true believers, is to tell the world. That is what God has given us uh, the next couple of years uh, for us to really, really get the message out in every way possible. And, uh, of course, uh, the most people of the world will disregard it. They will, they will uh, be in denial. They don't want to think about it. Some will mock and some will spoof and so on. Uh, that's, that's, they, they can do that. But amidst them, there will be a tiny percentage of people, uh, maybe uh, from what we can learn from the Bible, maybe like 3% of the people of the world who will take this very seriously and be recognizing their, oh my, my, what can I do? And they'll learn that even as the Ninevites, when they were told by Jonah that they only, the, the date of God's intended destruction of, of Nineveh, they they uh, humbled themselves completely and and uh, began to try to do uh, uh, right before God and and they cried out to God, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy! Is it possible that that date can be changed? And and uh, this uh, the Bible clearly indicates that in this case the date can't be changed. But I'll tell you, we can be be ourselves changed. It, it might be God's good purpose that he'll make us his child before the time comes of the end. And that's what we can beg God for and plead and plead and plead very humbly because none of us deserve anything but the wrath of God. And yet we can plead very humbly that we might have, have salvation before it is too late. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we're going to go to our next call. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Uh, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas and New Year's? Are, are we going to break for Christmas and New Year's? No, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas and New Year's? Oh, is it wrong? No, excuse me, we'll get into that. Hold on just a moment until we have this message. The caller has raised the question, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas and New Year's? Very, very interesting question. You know, it depends on how we celebrate Christmas and New Year's. Now think of it. Heaven celebrated Christmas. That is, that if we identify Christmas with the birth of Christ. And whether we had the right date or not, that's relatively unimportant. What is more important is that we are celebrating the birth of Christ. Now, when you think about it, the heavenly hosts sang to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest, and earth on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Those shepherds represented every true believer in the world because we, uh, when we become saved spiritually, we become shepherds. And, and so Christ, uh, heaven itself uh, celebrated Christmas. So why shouldn't we as true believers? But if we're going to celebrate it just as the world with any, without any thought about the Lord Jesus, well, then we're just celebrating it as a, as a, as just a, a day of gifts or a day when we get off from work or a day, uh, whatever else. Uh, and, uh, make no pretense at all that it has anything to do with Christ. And, and, uh, uh you can do that, but then don't get, uh, uh, make sure that that you you celebrate it in a way that you're not committing any sin. For example, uh, there are those who have Christmas parties and they're boozing it and and <laughs> they're letting go with all their morals and and so on. That's altogether wrong. The same way with celebrating uh, the New Year's Day. My, uh, it's it's a day when we ought to be thinking, isn't it wonderful that for how God has blessed us during this past year. Isn't it 
wonderful how he got us through this situation and through that situation. Isn't it wonderful how we've been able to serve him? And now, as we take this first day of the new year, uh, we... Uh, we, uh, you know, we, uh, the uh, secular world talks about New Year's resolutions. Not a bad idea for all of us, uh, but the resolutions have to be t tailored to the fact uh, now in this new year, oh Lord, oh Lord, help me to serve thee much more faithfully than in the past year. Help me to be a far better, uh, better, uh, uh, witness for thee than in the past year. Uh, oh Lord, help me to walk more humbly than I worked, walked in the past year. Oh my, we can really think of some marvelous spiritual revolu resolutions that we could keep in mind as we are celebrating New Year. But if it's the time of, of uh, uh, just a great day, uh, uh, nonsense going on and uh, 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 the, uh, having all kinds of uh, fun and games and so on. Well, uh, you can do that, but it has it doesn't have any value for you at all. And certainly you would not want to engage in sin on that day. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Proverbs. <laughs> yes, welcome. 25. 13. Proverbs 25, 13. Let's look at that. Proverbs 25, 13. There we read. As the cold of snow is in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. Now, what is, what is your question? Uh, the them and the masters. I don't understand. Yeah, well, the cold of snow, of course, is that when you're in a hot, normally the harvest time is in a hot summer time and you're sweating as you're bringing in the grain or, what, uh, or whatever else harvesting you're doing, and to have a cold drink that, because you were able to melt some snow. Oh, my. That really is welcome. There's no question at all about that. But, of course, the cold of snow has a spiritual application. God is not just interested in that, uh, that, uh, that earthly story. We have to find a spiritual meaning because that's the character of the Proverbs. And that is the cold of snow has to do with the gospel itself. It can be called cold or it can be called hot. If it's hot, it means that we are very zealous for the gospel. If it's cold, it's that it's the cool water of the word of God in a time of harvest. In the time of harvest is when we're sharing the gospel with people and there are people becoming saved. And it is a... Now, right, here's a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his master. Masters. Now, the, the fact is there's joy in heaven when somebody does become saved. Our masters are... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, there is joy uh, when we, when we, let's see, when we uh, uh, send, uh, it is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his, if we're faithful in sending out the gospel, in sharing the gospel, this is, uh, God is saying, that God is delighted. It's like refreshment to God himself. But thank you for calling, because we're sending out the gospel not on behalf of, of ourselves, not on behalf of an organization. We're really sending out an, the gospel on behalf of God himself. That is, that is we are, remember that verse, uh, ye are my ambassadors, Christ, as it were, making his appeal through you. But shall we take our next call, please? 
welcomed open forum. Hello? Yes. Okay. Yes, Pastor. Um, I have Jesus Christ in my heart, and I know the Holy Spirit because I can feel it in my life. And I'm praying to the Lord to have more uh, knowledge about that the message is from, from you right now saying that on 2011 is the, the rapt. I'm asking to the Lord to, to, to make me understand, um, because if you are able to understand that, so many, many of his child should be able to understand that too. The Holy Spirit should, should reveal to the child of God about what is coming. Well, excuse me. Now, uh, you are, you want to grow in grace. You want to grow, uh, you want to grow in the Word of God and, and that comes from reading the Word of God. However, there are certain things that are very complex. I, and, and like the dating of the end of time or the character of the, of the, uh, God's judgment plan or, uh, or the end of the gospel or the end of the church age. Some of these things are fairly complex and that's why God gives us teachers. Now, you don't want to trust the teacher, but the role of a good teacher is that he will guide you into the Word of God so that you can carefully follow the Word of God or, or, uh, or follow His guidance into the Word of God and, and learn from the Bible itself. Because finally, it is the Bible that is our, 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 the authority, not that, not that teacher. But he can be an assist in getting you into the Word of God. And that's why, for example, in such matter as the end, the, the timing of the end, it's very complex, very complex. And yet, uh, we have, as teachers in Family Radio, we have a, a little book prepared so that you can read it very carefully. You may have to read it a number of times and, and very slowly and, and check against the Bible. And slowly on, you can begin to learn more and more about that fact. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Could you please uh, read Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 9? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. There we read. Uh, verse 9. Verse 9. Yes, please. Isaiah 40, verse 9. Let's turn to that. 40, verse 9. We read, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord Jehovah will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Now, what is your question? Yes. Uh, the uh, terms uh, Zion and Judah and Jerusalem, are they all synonymous, or are they different things? Well, uh, in uh, Zion and Judah are, are pictures or synonyms for the kingdom of God. Uh, God, Christ uh, this is one who, the behold your God, is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would come to demonstrate how he had made payment for the sins of all those that he had elected to salvation. Uh, he would demonstrate a whole lot of inform to give us a whole lot of information about God's will for uh, our lives. And, and uh, then in, in the last days, he would... He would even uh, give us even more information from the Word of God. But it is so that we could glorify Him and could see in Christ what a wonderful Savior He is. And High Mountain, can you explain that briefly, please? The high, in, yeah, 
the high mountain again is a synonym for the kingdom of God. It's like we read in Psalm 121, lift up your, uh, or, or, uh, to the hills or to the mountains, I will lift mine eyes from whence cometh my help. It is the kingdom of God, or it is Christ who is the very essence of the kingdom of God. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Pastor. How are you? Go ahead with your call. Uh, What I want to know was, did Jesus... Or could you turn your radio off? I think we're getting some feedback. Please. Turn it down. All right. Welcome to Open oh. Forum. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I want to know, when Jesus descended, did he descend literally into hell? And where is that in the Scripture? Uh, the word uh, uh, hell is the word grave. Oh, grave. Uh, and Yes. And he went, like we read in... Uh, because uh, and throughout the Bible you'll find language like... Uh, 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 the lowest hell and so on. It means deep in the grave. In uh, uh, in uh, uh, Philippians, for example, we read that he did, he went into the lower he led he he went into the lower parts of the earth and led forth captivity captive. Now uh, he that is he died for us and uh, and the fact is we were spiritually dead at the time that he died for us and he brought us out as captives of the of the king of the Lord Jesus Christ as citizens of the kingdom of God. Oh okay okay. And thank you for calling. In fact, uh, you know it's it's interesting in that connection. I think this ties in. Let me see if it does. We read in uh, in Matthew 12 the only sign I will... The Jews were asking for a sign. And Jesus said, The only sign I will give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And that was a sign to the Ninevites. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now the heart of the earth has to do with death. That's you're, that you're in the ground. You're in the ground. And uh, so those three, the sign that that uh, that whole business from Thursday night when Christ is under the uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with God, O oh, Abba, Father, have mercy on me, all the way till Sunday morning, uh, which at which time he rose from the grave, uh, uh, and it encompassed three days and three nights. It all had to do with the death of Christ. That is the essence of atonement is that he died and paid for the sins of all those that he planned to save. Uh, of course, he didn't do this at the time of the cross. He just demonstrating how he did it. It was actually done uh, before he ever became the creator. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, Yes, I have a question concerning Revelation chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Revelation 11, verse 12 and 13. Let's look at that. Revelation 11, verse 12 and 13. There we read, And they heard a great voice. Uh, Well, uh, this is talking about the two witnesses. Now, they have... I've been busy during the last part of the Great Tribulation period, the final 4,100, 60, excuse me, the final 6,100 days. And, uh, and we read in the verse before that great fear fell upon them which saw them. And that has to do with everyone who became a true believer because we fear God. Uh, when, when, that's the nature of a true believer. If we don't fear God, in that we hate evil, in that we want to be more obedient than ever to God. We're not a child of God. Okay, well, that 
verse 11 is talking about those who became saved as they are witnessing during that 6100 day period and then they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them now that is talking about the fact that they are being or that they were raptured that is at the end of their of their work of harvesting in that 6100 day period come brings us to the day of judgment which is simultaneously the beginning of the day of judgment is simultaneous with the day of the catching up or the rapture of the true believers and of course these two witnesses represent uh, the true true believers as they are faithfully sharing the gospel during that fi final 6100 days and so they are caught up uh, they are changed instantly into a glorified spiritual body and in the presence of all those who remain unsaved and and that's 97 percent approximately of the world from all that we can learn from the bible uh, they, uh, they they are seen ascending up into heaven. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. I just yes. To, my name is Jeff. Yes. I wanted to know what you felt about once saved, always saved. Is that true? Well, what are we saved from? And how were we saved? We're saved from all of our sins. Christ did not save anyone uh, by paying for only some of their sins. He paid for every single sin, past, present, and future. And so there's no sin that a true believer who's been saved can commit that would cause him no longer to be saved or that for which he'd still have to make payment uh, because uh, of the wrath of God over that sin. That sin also was covered by the blood of Christ. So That's once saved, true. always saved is absolutely true. I don't understand like people that accept the Lord and they are saved and then they change their tune so say and become because they never did become saved accepting the lord won't save anybody that is a that is a terrible thing that has entered the churches uh because that's a work that we do and the bible is very certain very insistent that if we trust in anything that we have done however slight it may be we are not saved. There was uh, the work of salvation for each individual was uh, all the work was done by Christ. In fact, it was done before He ever created the world. And all that is left is that at some time in that person's life, God ha must He must because He's already made payment for their sins. He must give that person a resurrected soul, a new soul, which we, which comes at a time when we say we became saved. But as you notice that the work is 100% the work of Christ and nothing that we have done. <coughs> excuse, excuse me, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Thank you for call, uh, taking my uh, call. I just would like to... Let me turn it off. Uh, to, did you ever been invited to NA church to tell uh, to the people as uh, church age is uh, end already and uh, we have to just, uh, you know, uh, go home and... Uh, Ever since I've been teaching that the church is dead, which is quite a number of years now, I have never, never been invited to speak in a church. Uh, that, uh, that, now, it, uh, well, uh, let me uh, modify that. We did have a, a few open forums uh, back in uh, 
in uh, New York a few, few, a few years ago, and we were actually u- utilized a church building. But we were not there speaking to that church's congregation. We were not there on behalf of the pastor of that church. We simply uh, asked if we could uh, utilize that church uh, f- uh, as a meeting place for a family radio open forum. And in that sense, yes, I've been in a church and spoke in a church, but it had nothing to do with that congregation at all. Come if uh, any church invite you. No church has ever invited. Yeah, but if 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 someone in, invite you, if any church invite you, would you come to speak as a? Uh, well, if I were a, if I if I were able to arrange the time, I abso- uh, absolutely I would. I would be delighted to. I know they'd throw me out of my ear though by the time I got finished, but I'd be delighted be delighted to speak there. George but thank you for share calling and sharing. It, I, I, I don't think about that question at all because it will not happen. But thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. I have two questions. Yes. Um, in your Sunday teaching, you said that a judge is a ruler. But yeah. wouldn't a judge be someone who enforces the rules instead of a ruler? Wouldn't a king be the ruler and a judge be the person who enforces the law? You, you know, when we let the Bible define the word judge, like if you, you go to the book of Judges, go to the book, the whole book is named Judges. And what did those judges do? They, they uh, defeated the enemy that was oppressing them. In other words, they brought... Uh, relief from that pressure from the enemy uh, they were there to rule now of course they also had the task if someone uh, uh, they could find someone guilty of a crime and and prescribe a penalty for that person but the big task that they were engaged in was ruling and Christ is the judge of all the earth he is the supreme ruler Uh, that's why he is called the judge of all the earth. Now, he has set a plan for judging, very interesting, that he has given us his word. And the word, the Bible says, the Bible says that if we, the Bible says that if we, uh, uh, if we disobey the word of God, we are sentenced to death. So the word of God itself it is the tool that God, that Christ as the judge uses to judge us. We're condemned to death without ever having to stand physically or literally before Christ. We, the moment that we uh, disobey a law of God, we are already condemned. Now, when Christ is coming as the judge the, at the end of time, during the day of judgment, it's not so that everybody can stand before him and and be examined and then condemned. That's all been done. That's been done uh, as we commit each sin. Uh, We are uh, are condemned uh, to death. Uh, uh, But he is there simply to... and, and, And as a matter of fact, in that way, we've been standing before the judgment throne of God uh, uh, all our life from the day we're born uh, all of our life. We are standing before Christ as the judge because we're standing before the Word of God, which is what God uses to bring us into condemnation. And that has not been understood at all through the church age. And that's why the focus was on uh, we have to uh, stand, you still have to stand before Christ as the judge. But we've been standing before him uh, all of our life. And uh, and when Christ comes as the judge, uh, uh, when the Bible uses that kind of language, it is simply to complete the judgment program. Because there's one more thing or two more things that must happen, or maybe three more things, depending on who we are and what our situation is. But it's during that time 
that there will be extra wrath uh, put upon those who were uh, literally uh, told the day of the, the the biblical date of the end of the world, and they just they paid no attention to it, or they ridiculed it, or whatever. They will come into extra pain and agony uh, because of of uh, having done that, and that'll be part of God's judging pro- program that Christ will uh, d- develop uh, during the day of judgment. But uh, everybody uh, who has died unsaved will have their, if they've died, their bodies will be thrown or their dust or their carcass, whatever's left in the grave, will be thrown out and become uh, shamed, uh, a final shame before God. And that is part of the judgment process. These people won't know it. They won't have any conscious existence, but it will really happen. And then comes the lake of fire when everything is annihilated everything is burned up and destroyed there's nothing left and that's the finality of god's judgment process but thank you and we're going to pause for a message we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi brother Campy. i'm sorry i i got cut off i was asking about the ruler and the king but i had a second question um, I trust that the Lord will come in 2011, May 21st, um, but I'm a high school teacher, and a lot of my students uh, are pre- trying to prepare for life, knowing that they won't even graduate by this time, and I'm try- kind of conflicted. I bring the gospel into the, ch- I mean, to the school as much as possible, but it's kind of hard to... You know, be telling them, hey, you got to prepare for life and all that, because that's what we do in high school. But knowing that they only have less than three years and a lot well, of them although you're, you're a high school teacher, and uh, you know, your students have to live the next couple of years, and you can teach them a lot of, of uh, rich rules by which to guide their lives. Uh, even though it's only going to be a couple of years longer, it's not like like they, they those students can't learn a lot more about living in this life. Uh, now, uh, uh, you may not be permitted to talk about the Bible, and you, depending on what kind of school you're going to, uh, you're teaching. If you're teaching in a Christian school, then you can, uh, and then you're going to get into trouble <laughs> with. with with the school board probably, but uh, uh, you could you could start teaching about the fact we have to prepare for the very end. Uh, but uh, in a public school, you can't do that, and so. But at least you can teach uh, teach them how to live uh, in for the next couple of years. You don't have to underscore you're going to only going to have two years more. But what? What if you were teaching them how to live 20 years from now? It's not going to be any different, really, than two years from now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Um, I've been listening to you for quite a number of years, and I thank you for your ministry and your teaching. I have a question this evening regarding my mom's funeral. She recently passed away, and uh, her funeral will be on Friday. Is there anything... Um, is there anything wrong with my bringing the scripture readings, uh, not preaching a sermon necessarily, but just uh, bringing scripture readings that are important to me and have been uh, shared with my mom? I wish to share it with the rest of my family who are a mixture of Jewish and Catholic people. Well, uh, uh, are you going to have uh, someone there, a man there, who can give a spiritual message of some kind? Uh, No, in in light of the uh, end of the church age, I wasn't going to do that. Should I? Well, if you know somebody uh, who, uh, 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 if you know somebody who you trust as as a child of God. Uh, you could ask him if he would be kind enough to uh, bring a, a spiritual message. And, and as you bring your 
uh, you, you, you've asked a very interesting question. You don't want to get into the position of being a teacher, but on the other hand, you certainly can share the gospel. And you, you can weave into your comments about your relationship with your sister that uh, the, the, this is a passage that the two of us talked about and was very, very helpful to us. And, and here's another passage, and, and you could do it that way. I, I, I don't see any problem with that. Oh, I thank you very much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, he's chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, repeat your question, please. Uh, Ecle- Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. I thought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit, and so on and so on. And let's let's really start with verse 1. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, that is, with things that bring happiness. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, It is mad and of mirth, what doeth it? And then it said, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine and, and acquainting myself with wisdom and so on. Now, what is your question? The sons of men, are they the elect of, um, of the world? The sons My, of men? What was good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven. Oh, well, actually, God is using uh, uh, this, path, this talk to emphasize what the world can produce. And he's named a lot of fine things, like building houses and orchards and getting the fruit of it and, and so on, and, and uh, comparing that with what really is important. And, uh, and that comparison finally comes to a conclusion in the last in the last chapter because we finally get to the last chapter where he says uh, in uh, uh, verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for that is the whole duty of man for God shall bring many every work into judgment and every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil Okay, now let's go back to your question. He says, uh, 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 "And to lay hold, till I might see what is was good for the sons of men, that is, for the human race." For uh, this this book of Ecclesiastes is is attacking the problem of what is important from the vantage point of starting out with. All the most luscious and wonderful and and uh, happy things the world can produce, and it just goes on chapter after chapter with that kind of information, and then finally it gets to the end and says, "Uh, uh-uh. all of that is vanity. It's empty because you have to stand and answer to God for your sins, and you were standing to God all through our life." I don't have a lot of things, I don't have to worry. I'm sorry? If I don't have a lot of things, I, I don't... If people make fun of me for not having, like, a lot of things, I don't have to worry about that. Well, of course you're going to be ridiculed. What does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 5? We're going to be persecuted, we're going to be misunderstood, we're going to be reviled, we're going to be uh, shamed as the world is able to do it because 
as our as we focus on the more important things, the spiritual things, in a sense we are a we're bringing the world into judgment because everyone in the world uh, has the law of God written on their heart and they're not completely comfortable with their lifestyle. But when they see us uh, uh, looking for the more important issues of life. Uh, they that can be offensive to them because it reminds them that maybe all is not well with them. So we we should not be upset. We should not be discouraged when because we don't answer to our fellow man. We answer to God and only to God, and so. Uh, we don't have to worry at all whether they like what we're doing or not like what we're, we're doing. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, What um, I have a question for you, and it may sound a little extraordinary, but um, years ago a, a military person, someone very close to me that was, in the U.S. military described an uh, incident to me that um, uh, a UFO crash occurred in 1947 and there was extraterrestrial alien beings taken Yeah, well, from this. And <laughs> you know, our minds are very deceptive. And uh, there are people today who will testify that they saw a UFO and some little green men came out of that UFO and they talked with those big men and so on and they'll be absolutely convinced of it. If we become convinced enough of something, we're going to uh, see it happen. But there are no UFOs. There are none. This world is is a a world that is inhabited by humans, our 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 world is 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 designed by God, and it's all going to come to a crashing halt on the day of the last day of the day of judgment. And uh, but you see, the problem is that we become intrigued by. We become enticed by, we become, uh, we, we read about these noted scientists who have brilliant minds, and uh, they are they uh, are insisting that this world is billions of years old. They insist that, uh, of course, uh, by all the laws of probability, if this so of our solar system, our, our sun, which is just like another star in in a in the, amongst the billions upon billions of stars that are out there, if it was created, or no, excuse me, if it came into existence and spawned off a planet that was able to gender life and support life as planet Earth is then by any laws of probability, uh, that should have happened out there in amongst these millions of galaxies. And each galaxy has got umpteen millions of stars in it. So uh, it, 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 there's no question that there must be other, uh, other planets like ours. And so now it's only a matter of trying to come in contact. When you start out with the absolute certainty that is developed by this kind of scientific thinking, which is all haywire, of course, but by this kind of scientific thinking, then you, it, it's only a matter of, of finally seeing it. And, and uh, uh, at that time, our, our minds can really uh, do some hijinks. It can, they, we, we can really get locked into something that is not true at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, 
Yes, uh, you keep saying that Jesus Christ, he was in the grave um, Thursday evening, and um, so far as my calculation. No, I didn't say, uh, they, excuse me, excuse me. I did not say he was in the grave Thursday night, but he was enduring those things that have to do with the payment for sin, which which uh, uh, the, the final the, the, uh, emphasis is that he had to die for our sins. And, uh, and, and uh, that is all summed up in the demonstration that, you know, uh, that demonstration was like a parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So here comes Christ. He says, now look, I, I died before the foundation of the world in order to make payment for the sins of those that I planned to save. And that all happened, completely happened, and finished, was finished before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm going to demonstrate how I died and uh, how I was in the heart of the earth. That is, the heart of the earth has to do with death, how that death, how all of that developed. And it all started out in the, on Thursday night when he is being, uh, when he is uh, uh, crying out, Abba, Father, and so on, and finally gains its, its uh, greatest emphasis when his body is put in the grave and he rises again on Sunday morning. But it all is in total identification with that tremendous fact that he made payment for our sins by dying uh, uh, and uh, uh, soul and body for our sins, which is something we can't understand at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping. Yes. How you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. I what? just wanted to tell you, you're a great guy. Um, it's good to have family radio on instead of nonsense stuff. And uh, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah. And I want to tell you, you're right, the world is going to come to an end. But um, we're not certain it's going to be May 21st, 2011. We're not certain about that. But you are right. The world's going to come to the end. There is a God. What is your question? Do you have a question? Do I have a question? I have I have plenty of questions. Um, my question is, um, how long exactly has the earth been on existence? It has existed for right now 11,020 years. Did men really live to be 900 years old? Or is that a myth? Yes, before the flood. No, it, it before the time of the flood and, and for a little while after, men did live to be uh, 900 years. Methuselah lived to be 969 years. Noah lived to be 955, 950 years. Uh, Adam lived to be 930 years, and so on. It was... Uh, there, uh, they, they, it was not uncommon at all that they lived those long periods of time. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Evening, Mr. Camping. I've been wondering, does it really make sense for us to talk about um, things that happened before time existed with with terminology like before and after, um, such as the, the um, crucifixion? It would seem like if that was an event that happened outside of time, you um, could think of it in such a way that it didn't really wasn't really constrained by time, and in that well, way, we does it make sense for us to talk about it? Well, if the Bible talks about it, then we have to talk about it. We're not talk. We're not just manufacturing things to talk about. Uh, we're not seeing uh, dreams or visions. We are we are listening to the Bible. When the Bible says, for example. Uh, that Christ is the Lamb that was slain from from, from the foundation of the earth. That uh, th then we know that He's talking about something that happened 
uh, away from the foundation of the earth. And other passages indicate that uh, it had to be before creation. So it would be uh, uh, on the other side, from a, away from the foundation of the earth. And so the Bible talks about it, so we have to talk about it. Uh, that's the nature of the Bible. It is to teach us the things that God wants us to know. And when we learn something and we truly have learned it from the Bible accurately, then we have to teach it to others also. Could you please read Revelation 10, verse 4? Revelation 1? 10. 10, verse 4? Yeah. Revelation 10, verse 4. There we read. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, what is your question? Uh, what concerns me about this verse is that it doesn't say seal them up till the time of the end. It says write them not. And my question is, isn't it possible, isn't it God's prerogative to come when, if, when, if he chooses? And not necessarily as of the date, assuming that your you know your chronology is correct from the, from the Bible. Well, no, you see, it's just like Christ had to wait for the appointed time before he could be uh, before he could be uh, uh, announced as the Messiah there, and he had to come in the fullness of time. Our God has a very precise timetable worked out and. And and he can't vary that. He, that's locked in. That's that it's in the Bible, and there's where it is. And and there's nothing in the Bible that. Uh, that I mean, it it, it it's a, it's just like it says in 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 uh, oh that beautiful verse in Second Peter chapter three. I uh, beloved, there's one thing I don't want you to be ignorant of. A day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And 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 uh, it's talking right. about the two judgments, and they're exactly to the very day, seven thousand years apart. That uh, uh, very calendar day, to seven thousand years apart. And so, uh, you, uh, God can't modify that. Now He can't can't do anything different than what He's already put in the Bible. He says, though, that there may be something about the day of judgment that we don't know, that we can't know, because it hasn't been written? Is, what is God trying to tell us by saying that this, this this revelation from the thunders is not being written, and he's not telling us that it's... Well, I don't know. I know this. that In these last months, God has revealed an enormous amount of information. Right, I know. And it all ties together. Now, there may there may be some... Uh, little nuances about this that we're still going to learn about in the last couple of years, I, uh, uh, and that still is going on. But the main structure is really locked in, and and it's and we've already learned so much more as in these closing months that locks it even tighter in. So I don't anticipate any any major changes of any kind. I uh, could be wrong, of course. We have to just keep. Or reading the Bible, but I'll tell you, everything really is locking in tight. Mm -hmm. I just ask that you maybe look at that verse another a little bit more, and just try to. Uh, I just it just bothers me that it's something that he said don't write it. So it seems like there's just something that that's going to happen that we don't know about because it has not been written. That's why. Uh, well, I don't know why you're raising the question. I I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I don't quite follow your question. Well, in other words, in other passages, he'll say, um, like in Daniel, he'll say, seal it up till the time of the end. Well, that that look what <laughs> we're at the time of the end. Yeah, but this one doesn't say that. It says, write them not. It, in other words, it hasn't been sealed up. It's just not been written. Well, if they're not written, if the the best we could say about that is that. If it's not written, it's something that God did not intend we are to know. Because the Bible is the only written word of God. It is the only uh, message from God. 
but that could this could be a verse and I'm not certain of this but it's possible this could be a verse to indicate yes and but God still hasn't told us the whole story and if he hasn't written it in the Bible it's not going to be told to us either but it seems like he wants us to know that there's something that wasn't written if it uh, if you read the verse again 10 verse 4 he's telling us something has not been written and there, so he's, well that's we uh, we read that and it says write it not yeah and, and that means that God certainly is not <laughs> telling us every detail that we that that uh, enters into the time of the end he doesn't I, God is not mandated to do that at all. There may be other things that, but but what He has given us all hangs together. In other words, there aren't any gaps. It isn't like we we've got a period there in between. We don't know how that fits in. We don't know what that is. We everything ties together. Now there may be some other details that. Of, uh, of, but but they they still have to fit within the framework that God mm -hmm. already has given us. But yes. thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Mr. Kemping. Good yes. evening. I think uh, there is another verse which the previous caller could refer to, and I just can't put my finger on, finger on it. But it does say that uh, there are many things in uh, which Christ has said which are not written in the Bible. So I don't think we should be fearful of the fact that, you know, just because... Oh, you're, you're, uh, that's a good... Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a good verse. You know, we read in in John... And, and I thank you for that very, very much. In John chapter 21, in verse 25, and there are and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Thank you. That's a very good answer. And shall we take our next, our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, how are you, sir? Yes, go I, ahead. I got, I got two questions. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Mary, uh, or, or woman, take he, thy son, which is John, and to John, uh, take uh, her, your mother. Is Jesus putting an end to Mary being his mother? No, that has spiritual implications. Well, well, it had a physical implication that that uh, John uh, was uh, uh, was to care for Jesus' mother and be concerned about her. Uh, apparently, she didn't have another father, uh, and uh, but it it actually was in the form of a parable. John represented uh, the New Testament believers. Mary represented the Old Testament believers, and the. Uh, mm, let me see. I'm going to get. Uh, 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 I'm not going to finish answering that because I'm going to get it upside down, or maybe. Uh, but uh, but it has to do with the fact that one of them represented the Old Testament believers, the other the New Testament, and uh, and uh, he's admonishing one to care for the other. But shall we? We've come to the end of our time, and uh, and so I want to say good night to you. Good night. <laughs>